Very excited to be uh, here as the, uh, the one architect in the room has actually got a building being built. Uh, I did have the shovel ready, idea ready to roll about two years ago, uh, actually about 18 months ago when we started this project uh, for uh, Loyola University on the north side of uh, Chicago. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a Jesuit institution uh, whose core mission is uh, social justice and they thought that, uh, that uh, the idea of uh, urban farming and, uh, is something that they could use to promote their idea of social justice. So, um, so, we, so today I'll, I'll talk about the design and the process that got us to the, uh, to the solution that we are, are building right now and we'll start uh, finish construction by, uh, by uh, spring of next year. Um, and then talk about some of the challenges and some of the ways we were able to make an urban farm work in the city of Chicago. Uh, by way of uh, introduction, um, uh, I'm a design principal at Solomon Cordwell Benz. It's a uh, firm that's been around for about 80 years in the city of Chicago. Um, our, our bread and butter work is the work that we do uh, building cities. Um, so we're very familiar about how to execute designs, uh, designed high rises. Uh, so we've, we've built about 400 buildings, uh, or designed and built about 400 buildings uh, in the eight years our company has been around uh, in the city of Chicago and around the world. And so we have a, an understanding of how to deliver buildings that meet our clients' needs and also be able to adapt them for future markets. And I think uh, vertical farming is a perfect adaptation. Um, as I started to look at the design uh, of the building that we did for Loyola, uh, we were really surprised. Um, this was my first project in uh, urban agriculture um, at the amount of uh, transportation uh, that's required to uh, bring food to our tables um, around the world. Uh, actually, so many. Uh, the UK was saying it took over 2,200 miles of uh, transportation to get food to your uh, table every evening. So that's a tremendous amount of effort to uh, get food around the world. Um, and why is that? Because transportation is cheap, energy is cheap, at least in the US. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an industrialized food production that's around us um, and it's, and it's uh, sustained all of us for a very, very long time. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I think there's ways to adapt that uh, for the future of uh, food. Um, and then also there's a, a large migration of uh, people from rural areas uh, into uh, cities. So I think it's really appropriate that we start to look at ways uh, to, to provide urban agriculture in our cities. Um, it's happening more in the Asian cities than the U.S., but uh, it's, it's pretty big. So, and just from a personal standpoint, you know, I, I look at this, I live in the city, and I go to the grocery store, and I buy whatever I want whenever I want it. You know, it's, it's available to us, and I think the culture in America is like that. You know, we want blueberries the dead of winter in Chicago, and you know, that's what my son wants in his pancakes in the morning, so I do that for him. So, and I think a lot of us are, are used to that uh, demand uh, in, our, in our lifestyles. And you know, there's a way I think urban agriculture can help us do that. So, um, and as we look at the you know, way other industries are uh, really approaching this, um, everybody out there is trying to find ways to make their products better, uh, more efficient, use less energy, um, you know, Boeing's got it 787 if it, once it gets off the ground. Uh, the Toyota Prius, this is a project I did at Toyola um, a few years ago uh, that reduced its energy consumption by over 60% um, when we built it. Um, so there's, there's people out there and industries out there that are trying to uh, find these solutions. And I looked at what food is doing out there and I saw a lot of sort of desperate, uh, at least in the, in the urban environment in Chicago, a lot of desperate uh, uh, people that are working and striving to, to provide food uh, in a local way. Uh, this is actually um, uh, the garden of, uh, of uh, Rick Bayless, who is a uh, chef in Chicago, who is actually providing um, a, a good percentage of his food for his restaurant from his own backyard. This is a Chicago backyard right here. So um, we're actually working with the, uh, the grower of this, uh, uh, this to uh, provide the food um, in the building we're designing for Loyola. And uh, the, the amazing thing about this is that he is able to get uh, crops to grow through a wide variety of the year. I mean, Chicago is very cold for about uh, uh, six to eight months, so, uh, so you, you can't really grow things outdoors like this all the time, but he's able to do that. Um, and then we're seeing all these examples, a lot of examples of high-rises that people are trying to adapt into, uh, into, um, into vertical, house or vertical farming. Uh, these are very, very expensive examples, and I think the gentleman from uh, Germany uh, really showed how expensive this is. I mean, high-rise infrastructure in cities costs a lot of money. Um, you know, most of our buildings that are 50 stories high are probably 150, 200 million dollars, and they have to have a return on investment. And I think uh, buildings like this um, are harder to to uh, to develop uh, in this world. But just kind of going back to the story about Loyola, when we started looking at this, Loyola was very interested. Um, and integrating this idea of sustainability into their curriculum, and they already had. 
And so when we were starting to kind of study the idea of developing this new emerging program forum, which we were calling the Center for Sustainable Urban Living, uh, we looked at other examples out there. And we saw uh, when, when Thomas Jefferson first imagined uh, the first sort of democratic uh, uh, institution of uh, higher learning in the US, he imagined what is known as the ac academic academical quad um, at the University of Virginia. And really, it was quite fascinating as we started to look at this. This, is a, this, is a, this was sort of an idealized world where living and learning happened in a very small area. There was 10 different uh, schools um, that were on a main quad here for social reasons. And then in the, in the interior was a garden um, flanked by uh, student residences, classrooms, and actually a place to eat. And so uh, his vision was that everybody would grow their food out of this garden and learn about the variety of different crops in the US at the time uh, to, to really grow uh, food and learn about the environment and have a real uh, a love for the environment. This is a, an aerial photograph of, of one of those gardens here. He, he, did, he chose 10 to have different, uh, different places in the world, have all ty types of cultures of the world uh, represented here. And so we took that idea um, uh, and tried to integrate that into this concept of the sustainable urban living. Uh, Loyola has a program already uh, that's under, uh, underway uh, that's already integrated curriculum in an experiential way for students to get involved in hands-on ways to change the environment and to be involved in sustainability. Uh, this is one where they're actually taking cooking uh, oil from the, the dorms and using it to make biodiesel that runs their buses that go between their two campuses uh, in Chicago. And so they wanted another way for students to get involved. Um, so we developed what is called uh, this, this complex right here, which is called the Center for Sustainable Urban Living. Um, it's actually on a two-acre site on the north side of Chicago, but it really integrates uh, both living and learning in an experiential way. And you can see at the centerpiece of this is what we call a winter garden because it's illegal to call it a greenhouse in Chicago. So <laughs> that's how we got around that one. But, uh, but there, at the centerpiece of this is the heart of what we wanted to be this new modern living learning facility. Uh, it took uh, some of the romantic nature of the Thomas Jefferson model and applied it to the more efficient model that we use um, in the US now to develop our architecture. Um, and so what we have here is residential uh, that surrounds a large uh, winter garden here. And then adjacent to that is faculty uh, of multiple disciplines uh, there's business majors in here, and philosophy majors, and, uh, and scientists, and, uh, and uh, other people that are working together to solve environmental problems as part of their program for, it's their Institute for Environmental Sustainability. So all those people are commingled in one building. Instead of the traditional academic model where everybody's kind of spread apart, uh, everything is brought together in this building here. And uh, Loyola sees this as an opportunity to really teach people and engage people in uh, this in the future here. And the centerpiece of it is this large uh, winter garden which we've designed here, which is about 5,000 square feet of growing media um, and a variety of different types. We have aquaponics, aeroponics, we have uh, uh, actual plants growing in, in soil, uh, we have vertical applications. It's really a test bed for them to really learn how to do this and adapt this for future uses in, in the, uh, the world as they go out. Um, and then all that food that they produce there uh, the, the goal is to uh, serve it in the cafe downstairs, which becomes a kind of a community outlet for them. Um, and it allows them to, uh, to get involved with the community more and bring the community into the campus, which uh, the university was very uh, focused on. So uh, one of the things that was the most interesting thing about this is we got into the design of this. Um, I worked with some uh, very uh, talented people. Um, there's a gentleman from uh, uh, Stuttgart, Germany, uh, which runs a company called Transola that's very interested in integrating um, uh, systems. And I think we were just talking about systems integration. But, but when you start to integrate systems on a building aspect, you can really reduce the energy consumption. Uh, and it was really something we didn't realize until we started modeling different uh, iterations of this. But uh, at the, the census here, uh, the, the, at the heart of this is the, uh, is the academic facility. So that works in sort of a nighttime uh, or daytime operation. Uh, the residential works during a nighttime operation, and so we f tried to figure out a way to balance the energy between those two, and we used uh, geothermal as a battery in the ground to store energy uh, to, to uh, displace between the two projects. Um, and then the greenhouse itself is actually a, uh, a, a naturally ventilated, not a highly energy consumptive uh, winter garden that allows the uh, environment to come in and to cool and to uh, naturally take care of the space uh, so the plants can grow. And then we've worked with our, our farmer 
to uh, have a, a kind of a wide range of uh, plants that we can put into this facility that can grow at different times. So we can see that. Um, and I just wanted to have some figures here because a lot of people want to know how much it costs to build a building like this. Uh, it was roughly about $60 million. Um, I don't think my numbers add up here. I think it's $50 million if you look at that. But that's a very ex inexpensive way to deliver about 5,000 square feet of winter garden in the city of Chicago. So that's a very cost competitive way to do it. And the, uh, the more interesting fact here is when you integrate all these uh, mechanical systems, uh, life systems, uh, and people into the fold here, um, you're able to reduce the energy consumption of this building tremendously. Uh, so it operates at about 33 kBTUs uh, per year. Uh, for those of you that are uh, into the metrics, it's 100 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared uh, per year. That's a very, very low energy number. So it allows the university to operate a greenhouse in this facility here. And this kind of shows the steps that we took uh, to reduce its energy consumption. Um, and then and the, the benefit of this all is because we were so uh, focused on reducing energy consumption for the greenhouse, we were able to take the available roof area uh, and put photovoltaics on it and offset the operations of the building allowing more money for them to put into the, uh, to the greenhouse program. So, um, so in the, in, in the, at the end here, uh, we're seeing the opportunities of marrying uh, education and, uh, and uh, uh, hospital, or now housing into an urban environment to actually produce uh, these vertical farmers instead of having them as isolated elements. And this is a project we're currently working on in Chicago. We're actually we're developing a greenhouse along the whole south facade of the building. But just by adding this little, a little extra square footage to the building, uh, we're able to amortize the cost of something like that over the whole thing and provide those blueberries that I talked about to the individual grower who wants to live in that unit. So, and at the base of it, we give something back to the city, which is an urban greenhouse that they can go into and participate in this from a uh, standpoint. So all those elements are working together to uh, deliver some great buildings in Chicago. Thank you. Can we pass the mic to the questions so that the online listeners can hear something? So there's one question over there. Uh, have you looked at aerogel as uh, since you build, you, you can afford it in these buildings you build? <laughs> we have looked at aerogel. Aerogel is a very expensive insulation material. Um, and so we've used it very sparingly, but we have used it um, in, in, uh, in the, uh, the airspace between glass and some of our uh, skylights and things like that to reduce the energy uh, that goes through uh, two panes of glass, uh, which is a very inefficient way to keep the outside out and the inside in. So, but we have looked at that. And actually, we looked at uh, other uh, aero products that are, um, that are providing very thin uh, insulation for our buildings. And uh, I don't think it's commercially there yet, but we're close. Do you know if the university has any plans to actually calculate the cost of the food that they are going to produce in this uh, winter garden? Yes, they will, uh, they're very interested in understanding the metrics uh, behind this. That's why they've, uh, they've, they've enlisted us to develop the building that will provide all the <coughs> data um, that they can provide to the students to show how much it's costing to operate the building. Um, and how much it's, and so the students are actually gonna participate in the energy reduction of the building uh, as well. But that data will be able to translate in how much it's costing to make the food um, because obviously the baseline cost of the building and the energy cost of the building are two of the major components to how much the cost to develop that food. So, and it's part of actually, a, a, it's a field, it's a, it's a urban program, it's part of a field program. So there's actually, uh, there's something outside of Chicago where students will go and actually learn how to grow uh, plants in a uh, more of a open air uh, farm environment. This is more of a urban environment to see how the two uh, compete against each other, I guess, or what the economics are. But I would say in probably two or three years, they'll start publishing data out of this, uh, this building as it starts to get going. Yes. Yeah, uh, Devin, excellent talk. I have a question like with other talks. What do you think is stopping, what do you think is stopping this kind of development in all kinds of cities across the U.S.? I mean, it almost seems like a done deal. It seems, seems beautiful. <laughs> it seems like it's built. You can make the case from a few different ways. Can you think about it from like from two aspects, from your from the aspect of your discipline itself, the architectural aspect, and also all the other technologies that you would hope uh, could be brought to bear to make this thing even more viable? 
I do think the technologies that are available, as we were designing this building, we were working with some pretty basic technologies uh, to try to make something very um, successful. And so I don't think that, I mean, actually after being here today, I've learned a lot more about the technologies that are available. So I think, I think it's actually uh, a lot more doable than we think it is. Uh, I think the cost of, uh, of doing this as part of a larger building um, is incrementally more expensive. Um, you know, the, 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 the profit margins on residential developments that are financed by big banks and things like that um, are razor thin, you know. So adding that incremental cost to the exterior of a facade uh, that gets you that, that urban farm that's uh, locally grown food for you is, is more challenging. And I think that's where we have to try to figure out how to uh, optimize our buildings uh, so we're able to squeeze out more square footage in those projects uh, that we can, can give to the, uh, the people that want to participate in growing of their own food. So, but I do think there's also, uh, I think Loyola is taking an interesting approach where they want to educate people that this is an important thing to do. And I don't think our society right now is doing that. And I think uh, as more and more people get on that, uh, that idea, it'll start to take some more traction. So, and people will demand it. I think the, the economics of adding these to the projects will be overcome by market uh, pushes um, if people see the viability of able to grow something um, in an urban environment. Are there more questions to the speaker? Thank you. I have just one question, really quick. Uh, what is the ma maintenance that you foresee? Because you just built the building and then you pass it over to them, but it's probably also Sanjay's question. Uh, what is the actual day-to-day -day things that and is there a chance that they don't do it right and then this thing becomes a giant? <laughs> That's my biggest fear, that they don't do it right. Um, no, I don't think, uh, I, you know, I've, I've done 14 buildings with the university. Um, we're very invested in making sure that this building gets turned over and operates properly from a maintenance standpoint. Um, but uh, the university has to have play a critical role in maintaining this facility. Um, and we haven't estimated the cost of that um, they are relying a lot on student labor for the force that's going to help to cultivate the crops in here uh, as part of their, their program here. So there are people that are involved, but they're also bringing in uh, uh, dedicated farmers and things like that that can educate the students on how to maintain this. But I think it's a, it's a cost that hasn't really totally been quantified from Loyola's standpoint yet. They're really kind of taking the jump in to make sure that they can do it, and then they'll figure it out afterwards. So. <laughs> All right, thank, thanks Thank you. Again.